This is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast back in the uh, Creative Circus Library with Emily Sander. And you knew it was Emily Sander from the name of the uh, episode. Um, Emily and I have known each other now for probably about 70 minutes. That's um, right. Not a long time. Um, <laughs> although it's kind of odd to me that we never crossed, had never crossed paths prior. Um, the background is, uh, is interesting. We're going to get into the background. I'm not going to do a, a whole career retrospective here in the first 30 seconds of the podcast. Uh, let's just say she's been an advertising copywriter and creative director for 15 years with a two-year stint um, as department chair for advertising at SCAD in Savannah. She's currently, as you know from the description of the show, um, VP and creative director at Momentum Worldwide in New York. Um, I'm very curious to talk about uh, the evolution of the career, the evolution of advertising, what Momentum does versus the kind of work that you were doing early in your career. She was doing. We haven't even welcomed her here yet. Um, And... Also, I cannot wait to talk about teaching. I cannot wait to talk about mentoring. I cannot wait to talk about insights. Uh, I cannot wait to dig into this conversation. We just had a lively forum presentation from Emily with with all kinds of advice that makes sense to me. And hopefully the students. And will make sense to the (laughs) students in 7.5 years when they realize, oh, that's what she meant when she said all that stuff. But uh, welcome to the Creative Circus. Welcome to the microphone. Thank you. It's very good to be here. Um, I, uh, I I feel honored to be on a podcast. I've never really been interviewed like this on a podcast. Hmm. Have you been interviewed like with someone taking notes for a publication thing? Well, I was once on a student podcast at SCAD for the Women's Empowerment Club, that and they asked me a few questions. So uh, you were part but... of a whole bunch of other answers? Is that how that was? Or were you um, like a featured, featured person? It w- I was a featured person. Yep. Which was easy because they could just look in the classroom and go, Emily, can you do this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where, where would we hear that? Uh, ooh, I'm almost scared because that was my first time. <laughs> so there were lots of uhs and ooh and uh. So many people have been on this podcast. They said, this is my first podcast. I'm like, um, okay. Well, I listen to-, to them constantly, though. And I, I will tell you that my students made tons of fun of me for that one. <laughs> that, you, that you made? Oh, those. That I listen to them all the time. Yeah, the um, it's. It, I always find it interesting that this that people listen to. I always find it heartening and surprising that people listen to this because uh, I think the I think the content's okay. The production quality of this is kind of when it started out, it wasn't the worst thing on the internet. But like now, holy crap, pod, <laughs> podcasts are amazing now. Podcasts are a thing. Like they're produced. They are. There's a full orchestra in some of them. Right. I mean, and they're going live. Do you, you need to take this I on tour. Is really what you need to do. You I've need to go it. to the Bell House in Brooklyn. No, we've done. Did two, you two live ones? Yeah. Uh. The, actually, the last one that published last week. Well, I don't know when you're hearing this, listeners, but um, the one right after the one two ninety eight, I think, is the episode number. Is a live one in front of an audience at Mizzou. So we went with a Cole Weinstein, who is a, a ECD at FCB and went to school here, and. Um, that was at Florida. And then we did one at Mizzou with Katie Hornaday from Barclay, who went to Mizzou and Circus. Nice. And we did one in front of an audience. And it's a cool rhythm to have like yeah. a live audience and have live questions. It was kind of fun. I got to tell you, uh, I have, I'm, fight, I'm currently fighting my urge to want to step up over and interrupt you because this is what I traditionally do in life. And I try to stop myself yeah. from doing it. We and I, and, and for here, I... I uh, I'm trying to because I, I also know it's a podcast and I shouldn't step on the host. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Here's what I'm going to do. Listeners, I feel, so I feel like so, I'm silent. So listeners, this is what we're going to do. So I'm going to give right now, I'm handing Emily a piece yes, of paper I got and it. a pen and yep. a pen. Yep. And if you have a thought while I'm talking, you write it down. Because one thing I've learned, this is the trick. I should have said this. to the, So there's a team at, at school that are going to do a podcast. They're going to do conversations. They're not doing interviews. Sure. If you do interviews, you have to listen. Uh, yeah. And I think you and I might have the same affliction. Like, I, and my my wife will attest. I've got a problem. I feel like I've I'm got, looking at myself right now, only I, I, um, with more facial with hair. With facial hair, I've got a, I've got, a, I've got a problem. And and I've actually had reviewers of the pod like call me out on it. 
Like, stop fucking... Look, Dax Shepard, who does Armchair Expert, which is one of the wonderful podcasts that I've, I and I referenced it earlier, um, he apparently got a lot of write-ins, too, about stepping over people. So uh, apparently, if you step on people while you talk, you'll mm. make a great podcaster. I don't know, man. And uh, so <laughs> also, just you know, behind the curtain a little bit, so, so you and I are recording this, for the listeners' sake, we're recording this on a single track. It's a stereo track. When I do them remotely, which I hate to do, but occasionally we'll do remotely, each person's on a separate track. So if I interrupt them, but they keep talking, I can delete my own voice. <laughs> so the listener never hears so me. They think that you, wow, you listened really well in yeah, that last should, episode. I don't know how you kept it quiet through that whole part. <laughs> um, all right. So I've, I don't even know where to start. I, I have uh, all so these conversations, oh, so many things to ask you and talk about. Um, I don't even know where to start. So the thing that you and I have in common, besides being copywriters and having worked in New York and... Um, all this sort of resume stuff is this two and two and three quarters years yeah as chair of advertising at savannah college of art and design that's right and i want to i want to ask you because I could, we could do a whole podcast about that <laughs> i want to i want i want to hear from you what you think makes um, a good student and then i want to know as a creative director what you think makes a good junior so what when you're in class what are the what makes a student in your mind stand out what makes them memorable what makes you want to champion them what makes a good student mm, i don't think that the uh difference is that far apart between a good student and a good junior from from what i saw and by the way right down the street from you too only three and a half hours i oh, was yeah. yeah i was in savannah georgia and you're in atlanta so we are also we're at least in the same state yeah it's a, um it's an interesting state the uh, yeah yeah it is <laughs> um I I would say that the students that I could tell wanted it. And by that, I mean, really wanted to solve the problem and were interested in investing and invested in staying in it, coming to me with questions, trying it out different ways, um, were very much the same, you know, successful students as they were the successful juniors. And that advertising is a business that demands resiliency and mm. the, um, and kind of, the stick to itness that that kind of um, of enthusiasm requires. I, I would always tell students, you need to make sure that you're coming into advertising with, and I'm and what I'm doing right now is I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to raise it all the yeah. way up to the sky as much as I possibly can yeah. with that much passion, because every single project that you work on is going to kind of deplete it and kind of chip at it a little mm -hmm. bit more and more. And if you're not that enthusiastic, if you don't have that much passion, if your parent made you go into this. Or, you know, if you're not here for, um, because you want it, it's gonna, you're gonna burn out quickly. And you're also just gonna give up on projects quickly because you're not driven by that want to solve the problem. What percentage of students that you saw do you, and of course, okay, so SCAD and the Creative Circus have a qualified audience. So it's already basically kids that have decided this is something they wanna do and they already sort of have an innate built in passion. But what percentage of them do you think overall? demonstrated that sort of dedication and resilience well scads even a little bit different because they would they would major in advertising mm -hmm. but because um you know scad exists as a four-year standalone institution so some students really did pick advertising just because um maybe their parents suggested it was a good career path for them mm -hmm. but maybe they're actually more enthusiastic about illustration or right. photography mm -hmm. or something else um and i think because of that i might even have a, a it might have been a lesser percentage than mm -hmm. you have at Creative Circus. So I, I would know. say, I mean, I would say there was probably a solid 50 mm -hmm. okay, that I thought you will succeed. Mm. And then there was like 25% that I thought you you want to figure it out, but there are built in, like there's, you might not be natural at it. Not everybody's going to become a professional baseball player, you know, right. but they might really like baseball. Um, and then I think that there were probably, there was that percentage of students who didn't necessarily really want advertising. Right. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you, in your role now, do you look at books or is that something that kind of I do. books are already, okay. So I do. How do you look at a portfolio? And then this is two different ways I'm framing the question. One is how do you evaluate work? Is it about ideas? Is it about strategy? Is it about craft? Is it about something else? So first of all, what are you looking for? And the other what other question is just practically, mm -hmm. how do you look at a portfolio website? Like, yeah. do you looking at, you know, you understand yeah. the question? Are you looking top left and straight uh -huh. to it? Are you going straight to the about me? Or <laughs> so? Okay. First question is, how do you evaluate 
what makes the person what is it in a book that's going to say i want to meet this person um, you what know, do you look for? okay. Well, the the first question you asked is what you look for, and you kind of you kind of gave me like concept, craft, strategy, and mm-hmm. uh, the correct answer is going to be all three. Um, but I think that I look at okay. I'll tell you what. If the idea is sound, it and the concept is sound, it probably means that it it matches the strategy on some level, mm-hmm, right? So I'd we say it's a, a little bit of combination. Wait a second. Hold on. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point because you can't have an idea without a message. You can't have an idea without strategy, right? If it's good, idea right? A, I, well, good idea is, an, is a solution to a problem. Yes, exactly. So it all it's inherently right, right. meeting a strategy, okay, right? Great. Um, and they have to have craft because I have, um, you know, being back in the industry, it's also you quickly realize you need the people that can do. You can do it. You need yeah. the makers, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, I look at books differently than before, though. Um, my experience at SCAD kind of put me in front of students who are trying and, and, and in front of a lot of books. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's a, there are a certain number of creatives out there who forget what it's like to be early on in your career and are so used to looking at books from senior levels that they forget that when you get a book from a junior level, there are going to be some imperfections built in. Because right. first of all, they also didn't have billions of dollars of budget, not billions, but millions of dollars right, of budget right. to, to perfect it and make it, right. you know, produce it really great, you know? So the... I kind of look at it with um, a, a little sense of compassion. Right. Yeah. Because what you're talking about is that you are aware that when you look at a TV spot in a student's book, that you're looking at a comp. You're looking yeah. at a, a rough, a rough, yeah. a rough take. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there, I, I for, for example, I looked at a couple of 15 second spots from a student of yours earlier mm-hmm. today. And um, in my opinion, they were great. Mm-hmm. I bet that I could also show them to somebody else in advertising who will go, the edit's a little bit off and the color here. Because they forget these are these are students who are going out with a phone in hand right. and you know mm-hmm. filming it and cutting it together. So as long as the concept and the idea is great, wonderful. Because mm-hmm. they're going to have an editor mm-hmm. and they'll sit in the edit and they'll be able to direct. But they're going to also have somebody who's whose sole focus is that part of the job. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so how do you look at websites? Uh, you know, it's funny that you asked that because when I was looking at your students' work today, um, I told them I was going to look at the uh, first three things in their book and that the, and then I, they would present the three and then I would give them feedback after. And so I would make them awkwardly sit while I silently mm-hmm. sat there and they would awkwardly present, probably get nervous. Uh, but I told them from top left mm-hmm. over, right, to one, two, three, across to the right. Mm-hmm. Because typically speaking, the way that I would look at books and most recruiters I know, Look at the first one, and if they're like, huh, they're okay, there's something smart here, they'll make it to the second. If they make it to the second and there's something good, they'll make it to the third. And if the third confirms what they learned from the first two, they'll probably send it out in the agency or immediately jump to the about me. Um, If they don't make it past the second, the book's out. Um, that's my, that is my experience because they get so many books. And so they're kind of doing a real quick, like, look, top level scan, which also indicates, does the student know what work is good? Because if they, they're probably naturally going to lead with their best, right. and then you know they've got to pick that, and is that what they think is the best, and why? Um, about so me, I'll, if I really like it, I'll probably jump to the about me after the second, just to go, huh? What is this kid's history? That's interesting. Um, and then I'll come back to the third. God, it's different. That's different than me. How do you look at them? I always look at the about me first. Uh, I I know a lot of people who do that because I that's do. the thing that is open-ended and that's the thing that's the purely chances are to me i feel like that's the one that's the most accurate about that person's ability to to express something versus the collaborative part component or the guide guiding yeah. from the partner and the creative director or teacher i'll tell you what i i have seen um some books where the first two there's something so interesting and unique about the voice hmm. And the idea itself might not be That's perfect, cool. but mm-hmm. the voice itself is so different that then I, I definitely will jump to the about me. Um, even if I don't love the first two, I'll stick with that it. And then if the about me confirms this person's interesting yeah, and they're bringing something new to the table, then I'm, I'll, I'm in. Right. The about me for me is not, it's not a bad about me. Is not going to make me not want to look at the book, but a good one's going to be like, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. And I have met and I, I've worked with those people in the past who had really interesting books coming out. I remember early on in my career, 
in my second year, the recruiter at, and I was at JWT early on, came to me with this box in hand and she goes, well, take a look at this. And, and it was like a, like a cigar box mm -hmm. practically with like design and some stuff inside. Can't even remember what was inside, but it was, it was so strange. She goes, that's a, that's a kid's book. Hmm. And she goes, I, d I don't know what to do with it, but there's something about it I think is genius. And, um, when I said, yeah, I think so too. It's something I'd never seen anything like it. And, but it also didn't, it wasn't traditional. And then it wasn't like, and back then it was many books, right? right? right so right. it wasn't like, and then here's an ad, and here's an right. ad, and here's mm -hmm. an ad. Um, and so she called that kid in and then that kid ended up becoming, was Scott Bell, who oh, wow. went on to Droga and, yeah. you know, did a, won a bazillion awards and did Newcastle and um, the Super Bowl work What was for in that the box? What was in the great. box? They were like these like, um, like laminated weird ad samples. Okay. They were not... Perfect, but and if Scott Bell is listening to this, I apologize if no, I'm completely no, misrepresenting I, I, you. I think you're safe. But <laughs> 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 but yeah, it was it was great. It was a really good. Um, it was a smart call on her, on her point because he he's genius. He's he showed, really smart. Showed yeah. something fresh. Yes. Um, all right. So changing the subject a little bit, we had mentioned you'd mentioned at lunch. This we had a short lunch. Um, this ten year thing. So ten years into the yeah. career, um, you start teaching. Ten years into my professional creative careers when I started teaching, do you think that, that that's a mark that's kind of a universal sort of come to Jesus slash midlife crisis issue for a lot of creatives? I got to tell you, I, I found that the 10 year was the number that kept popping up over and over again with a lot of friends that I knew mm -hmm. who started flaking off at about the 10 year and some went on and, and started their own company. Like mm -hmm. some went on and started their own little thing on the side or some went to freelance or some just did what you and I did, and that's jump to a different mm -hmm. industry, parallel, but different. Mm -hmm. And um, even my neighbor at the time, I remember, this is in the midst of me, and I went to SCAD when I was about 12 or 13 years in, but my wilderness, I should say the wilderness portion of my career when I was kind of journeying in my head and trying to figure out what would inspire me again, happened around 10 years but even my neighbor he and his wife were both in creative mm -hmm. and they both quit their jobs at 10 years in. Yeah, that's weird. yeah yeah my i think it was eight i think i've said this on the podcast so i apologize to listeners i think it was eight and a half years in in new york when i i didn't even know i was going to say this it just came out of my mouth i said i'm not going to be doing this forever mm -hmm. there was something about it that um i kind of have this this itch so i guess i'm only talking about this now because i think that that's a normal thing and i think that what I, one of the things I talk about a lot in class, and see if I'm I'm saying the right stuff, yeah, is to is to encourage people in their 20s and 30s to start thinking about what's important to them and what they ultimately want. I think yes. students are so focused on getting a job, it's like a job to what end? Like, what's the end game? So that you actually have permission to pivot or redefine or whatever. Yeah. That you're not failing if you decide to do something tangential, and that and that this is one of the very few, in my opinion, one mm -hmm. of the very few careers that everything you do can be applied to something like you're learning so much about yourself and, and solving problems and, the, and, and yes. the process and collaboration that you can take this and do other things. Advertising is uh, probably the most flexible job in the world. And when I was at SCAD and we would do, um, we would have families coming through or kids coming through and I would ask the kids, you know, well, what are you interested in? Um, and these would be kids who were looking at schools or were just new, uh, you know, and they said, I don't really know. I'm kind of trying a few things out. I always thought in the back of my head, advertising will be perfect for you. And mm -hmm. I told some of them advertising will be perfect for you because you do a little bit of everything. Yeah. We were talking at lunch, too, and I kind of touched on this um, because you just brought up something interesting about it's a it's a career, but is it what you really want to do? And so I mentioned at lunch that I picked this when I was in seventh grade, yeah. and I uh, and at that time I called it an advertising agent. Now for right. some reason I was the type of kid that thought I had to have my whole life and my future mapped out by home economics of eighth grade I wish for I an exercise. That's not bad. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> not... I never gave it any thought. Obvi yeah. Obviously, <laughs> I I I picked it because I watched a lot of television. I liked entertainment mm -hmm. and I liked comedy, and I thought I could do all three of those things. I'll make ads. I called it an advertising agent, but what happened is, and then I spent you know, high school and for a while it was like commercial art and then it kind of, and then I went through journalism at Maryland and then I went on and you learned writing. And then I found this person who said, you got to go to portfolio center and develop a book. And then I discovered, oh, it's copywriting. Mm -hmm. And um, I just snapped. If anybody wonders what that weird noise was, I forgot I'm on a podcast. It wasn't too loud. Okay, great. Um, 
But about around uh, 35, 36, around the 10 year mark um, from when I had graduated from graduate school and started my job in New York, I started to really question, did I pick that too early? Mm. Did I just pick it because I was watching a lot of TV spots and am I really supposed to be doing this? And is it fulfilling? Is this what I should be mm. doing? And I started to kind of balance, um, you know, that's maybe, maybe teaching, maybe, te mm. maybe that. And then I went, I taught. And what was so amazing is through teaching, I realized I do love the making. Mm -hmm. I, I had actually had it right all along. Mm -hmm. And there is something fundamentally wonderful about the puzzle piecing of advertising. I don't know if I would still be teaching if it weren't for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I'm not saying that I'd be irrelevant. I'm saying that I get to create something and edit this thing. And like, to me, it's sort of like, it's not the same as writing, but it's something that I think I was, even when I was, a, see, when I was a kid in seventh grade, I pretended to be like a DJ. Yeah. Like literally I would have a record player and I would like out loud like, in my room. No, 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 no. Not a hip hop DJ, like a radio rock oh, radio yes. guy. So I would like, I would like have my, my, I would actually talk in between tracks of, of, albums just <laughs> pretending like i was on the radio so i think i was kind of like always wanted to like have my my literal and and figurative voice out there somehow so to me i think that i never thought about it but i think that i wish i'd been self-aware or encouraged to understand like maybe the thing you're into could be could provide for you at some point yeah like maybe the fact that you like to draw or play video games which is absurd you could have a career as now you know what's in Atlanta this weekend is like the is like the FIFA E World Cup or some shit. There's like a tournament going on. These kids make bank playing video games. I'm not. I'm just saying that the thing that you're into is probably your programming for your future. Yes. And I think that a lot of people don't really aren't aware of that early on. And even when you start working, yeah, you're a writer. Yeah, you're an art director. But that other thing that you're really into, there, I heard that quote once. Like the thing you do in your off hours is the thing you should be doing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know I. A, a couple things. One, you and I really are similar. I first of all, I I really am excited to be on this podcast because I feel like my voice should be out there. Yeah, everybody should be hearing me. And that I like was a, that, that sound like a douchebag saying that. <laughs> no, 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 no. You didn't. I don't know if anyone's the hear problem it. is I really was going. I totally agree. All right. Um, I was a radio DJ at University of Maryland oh, wow. for a little bit, and I loved. Oh, see, it. I would have loved. Yeah, that. yeah, loved it. I went to the um, wrong. I went so to the wrong great. school. Had the wrong major. Um, <laughs> No, for real. I mean, like I went to Indiana as a business major because I just thought you graduate from high school, you go to college, you get a job wearing a suit selling. I don't even know selling. Go to be a businessman. I didn't even know what that meant. Right. Um, so I want to talk. Okay. So I want to run through this very quickly. Yeah. Kramer Crassel, Chicago Portfolio School, Kirschenbaum, Bond, Cynical, and Partners, JWT, Translation, Havas, 360i, SCAD, Momentum. I want to talk about this sort of this sort of concept of, of cultures. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about how... Mm -hmm. Um, a student going or a student or a junior going into an agency, what, how are you aware of and how do you define and evaluate like what a culture in an agency or a school, what does it feel like? What, how do you, how do these different cultures compare without naming names? What are some of this, uh, I guess, typical archetypal sort of cultural things that can happen in a job and in an agency? I've definitely been, that list uh, reflects a lot of vi very different cultures. And um, and in fact, I, I was JWT twice. So that's actually where I started right before mm. Kramer Crossell. Mm -hmm. And uh, going from a, starting off in a big agency culture. Mm -hmm. And back in 2004, um, you know, it kind of felt like it was still closely linked to Nine to the nineties, mm -hmm. which almost feels like a different era. I mean, it really was a different era in this business. But big ships turn real slow, real slow. Mm -hmm. And um, but fortunately, I was there when Ty Montague started, mm -hmm. and so I really got to be. Uh, I got to learn from him and be a part of that culture. And, and fortunately, that was my first two years in the business, so that kind of tilted my whole career in a certain direction. Um, but you know, going from a big from it, I, I was in a big agency, I was in a smaller agency, which felt a little bit more personal, you knew everybody, everybody kind of sat right around you. I've been in midsize, I've been in agencies that are so small that you feel like you're in camp. Oh. And you're just um, scrapping something together. And what do you like? I love, uh, and I was mentioning this earlier on in the talk, I really do love cultures that are not competitive at the core but are um, like family or, mm. or collaborative or supportive because I feel like you do make great work. You can make great work. You don't have to compete 
with each other in order to push each other. You can actually celebrate and help each other rise up. What's more common, do you think? I think now, collaborative. Yeah. I think when I started, it was really based around this kind of fear factor and, and you were, you were driven by threat. And, um, and I think now, especially with the splintering of the agency into all sorts of different content shops and experiential and, you know, and also the culture of the student coming in and the people. And Mm. I think that everybody's a little bit more collaborative and Mm. a little bit more, they want to exist in an environment that does not feel abusive. So You, I find that um, in the last few years of my career, I have been in agencies that are much more supportive and do care to some extent about retention, which you know is obviously an ongoing issue in the industry, but really do actually try to help um, to help the creatives and help the employees stay on and grow and succeed and get better. It's a can of worms can open it up. Do it. Speaking of retention, and people talk about diversity and inclusion. Yeah, um, hiring is one thing; retention is another. Mm-hmm. Is, do you, Do you feel like momentum has a focus on on enabling uh, a diverse workforce? Anything from I'm talking about minorities to women to uh, um, dads. I mean, is, right. is there? Is there? <laughs> yeah. This is one of my no, I know. one of my biggest peeves ever. Is that like there was this assumption. That that I was going to be dependable because I am a man, and therefore you don't care about your children, and right. you can say they're all around the clock, right. right? Whereas a woman is automatically tagged as problematic when she has a baby. It's like right. the double standard almost felt like I was getting away with something that I was bullshit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, uh, anyway, whatever. So, is is are these conversations things that have come up? You're in a leadership position now as a vice president. Mm-hmm. Is, are these things that? And I don't necessarily want to either throw momentum under the bus or sell momentum, but is this some, uh, something that agencies that you're seeing now are aware of trying to retain? And I'm, I forgot to throw in ageist um, into yeah. the mix as well. Okay, so I've only been at Momentum for three months, and so I'm going to oh, use right. that as my political way to get around yeah. naming yeah. anybody yeah. Yeah. <laughs> being specific. But what what I will say is what I've seen across the industry, and I have definitely seen it in Momentum. Mm-hmm. Um, is an, an awareness and an attempt to celebrate and definitely be a part of creating a culture that is more diverse. Mm-hmm. And I personally have investment in that. I'm LGBTQ mm-hmm. and I, um, you know, that's important to me and it has always been important to me across my career. So, you know, my presence on any project, I bring that, I think, um, an awareness to not, you know, I try to avoid uh, subconscious bias that can happen, mm-hmm. right? And probably has happened for years and really look at ideas for ideas. It's not it's not anything beyond that. But mm-hmm. let me talk, uh, my experience thus far at Momentum, I mean, I sit on the 4A's foundation board, Chris Wilde did, mm-hmm. who, um, you know, is the head of Momentum and, uh, and he had a large role in it. Um, and I have worked with ad fellows at the agency on a project that they're working for. So to for me, my immediate awareness is yes, there's definitely a celebration and a support for it. I also uh, at 360i to your dad point, mm-hmm. my partner there, wonderful man, and a devoted father, mm-hmm. and he lived in Connecticut, and it was important mm-hmm. for him to go home and see his children. Mm-hmm. And I did it cost him anything. No, it didn't. And 360i was a really, it was another wonderful culture mm-hmm. that I worked in that I, I really loved that agency. If I had not gone to SCAD because, you know, this entirely different avenue presented itself, I probably would have stayed there for That's a cool. while because I really like that culture. And I think culture can keep, can keep people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, we don't need to stay there. We're going to move on. Yeah. Um, going from SCAD to Momentum, going from a department chair to teaching straight back into the, into the, Frying pan, so yeah. to speak. What adjustments did you have to make? What what surprised you? Was there anything that was, or was it a seamless ramping right back into the industry? How did how did that feel? And I'm t- I'm yeah. personally curious about yeah. that move. You thinking about it? Uh, Are we announcing always, something on the podcast always, right now? Always possibly. <laughs> um, so I uh, I was at SCAD for two and three quarters a year, right? So just under three years. My position at SCAD as chair um, allowed me to still be in touch with the industry Mm -hmm. and my friends that I, and the relationships that I had developed uh, previous and prior. So um, I, you know, I, I moved to 
outside of the industry. And I definitely felt like I was outside of the well, industry. Well, you were geographically way outside. And, and geographically way right. on the island, practically. Yeah. <laughs> but I was still connected to the people and to what generally was going on. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, as you know, any good teacher anyway who has wants to, to remain re relevant has to be. Because mm -hmm. uh, especially because it happens so fast and moves so quickly mm -hmm. and changes so quickly. So going from SCAD to Momentum was not as big of a shift. Now, trust me, I was doing the math in my head and kind of formulating how long is too long. If I were to stay at SCAD for mm. four years, am I out of it? Yeah. And I looked at it like, no, I'm, ju I'm still within the window mm -hmm. where I can come back and everything feels uh, like the, the landscape is a little different. There's definitely new agencies that mm -hmm. have come up and there, there are some things that have happened in the last year in terms of different movements. But uh, the work itself, it was like I slotted right back in. It was a very bizarre, That's I got to cool. say, my my first month back in the city was very bizarre because I felt like, and I've told friends this, I felt like I was cryogenically frozen because I left in the winter months and I returned in the winter months, so it's almost like I had the same wardrobe. Like I wore the same oh, wow. outfits because so I <laughs> so weird. never, I never had a reason to buy new winter clothing, so I just was popped out. That's yeah. so funny. <laughs> well, I did write this down too. So this is this is sort of related. So in the last fifteen years since you started your career, what what is the biggest change you've noticed in the industry? And I mean, a place like Momentum might not have been around fifteen years ago. I mean, like the work that you guys do, and it's experiential, it's interactive. But what, what, what have been the biggest, what's the biggest single change you've noticed in your 15 year career so far? You know, it's the race to the middle. I mean, it, it's, it's the race to understanding, oh no, wait a minute. I taught this in one of my classes in my intro class, trying to kind of get students to understand the landscape of the industry and what they think it is versus what it really is and what's happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, so in the course of it, you know, I started a very traditional agency where it was various agency of record and all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. And over time, um, digital hit, you know, and digital put the fear in a lot of agencies. And so then you get digital shops and then you get, you know, clients going project. Digital put fear in the smart agencies. Digital was ignored by a lot of them. It was, Thinking that it, it would was, just go away. It was farmed out. Yeah. Like, okay, you oh, handle right, that like right, direct mail, right. whatever. That's not really what we do. Right. Where fear is a great word because that was Rich Silverstein's answer to it. I said, you guys, I said, Goodby Silverstein and Partners of every agency that I can think of in mm -hmm. the country was the best at adapting general pure creative thinking to interactive the interactive and digital space with the there's a got milk game some really cool interactive yes stuff. yes I, said, I remember where that. did that come from he said terror of being yeah. irrelevant yeah Ta so this is why i say i was lucky that ty montague had come on at jwt when i started mm -hmm. uh because he came and, and he brought widen and kennedy chops with him mm -hmm. and he could see the future of the business cool. and and could see this sort of what then was 360 storytelling, mm -hmm. uh, which was new at the time to everybody else because they just thought, oh, banner ads are just some resize things and give that to our GA exactly. and whatever, throw it up right. there. But he saw that, no, it's actually the new media avenue for storytelling and that people are no longer going to be watching television eventually and they're going to be going to content online. I, I think if I had not had him, I think the course of my career might have been very different, but mm -hmm. I, I was kind of put in this cooker of fear of an illumination, what's going to happen. An illumination. And, an illumination mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm so glad for that. Now what happened is some of the smart agencies were fear. And then after a few years, they, the ones that were slow to it realized they have to, because they're, they're losing business. Right. And the, then, the fear was based of seeing the fear was based in seeing the future. The other ones were oblivious to what was coming <laughs> until too late. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then social happened, mm -hmm. did the same thing digital social happened. Social screwed everything up. And then um, social kind of pushed the pushed the lens into PR and experiential mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because now if you're talking about things, you better have something to talk about. You better have, got, you better have something to share, right? right? If you're not doing something interesting, you've got nothing to share. So then that kind of pushed brands to become more human and create spaces that would allow direct contact with people. So now we're into this intellectual property space, yeah, you know, right. yep. where now brands and, and campaigns have to actually create something that they can put into the hands of consumers because really now we're that close, right? That's interesting. And so that's should, what's interesting. Yeah. So, so should I not be teaching writers to do print ads? <laughs> the funny thing is, is that I, any recruiter that I talk to, and you've probably heard the same thing, um, 
still believe you still have to have a concept that is boiled down into a really good print ad execution. And, and that should be in your book. Now I told students don't do tons of them. Mm -hmm. You just need a couple of strong ones in order that are just real quick wins. Right, right, right. But, um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, although to some extent, I kind of believe that well, print just morphed into, into online, like Instagram content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. Your captions need to be good. Yep. Right? Yep. All right. Um, let's talk about you. A couple of things about you. Okay. All right. So so far into the career, what do you what what, what would you qualify as your biggest success? What do you, what are you proud of or happy about? Well, my biggest professional success is definitely uh, working at translation, and I'm almost gonna I'm almost gonna say the whole thing uh, because when I went there, um, I had I was leaving JWT, and I was frustrated at the time that uh, I had been in the business for about eight years at that point, and I always felt like I had good management leadership chops, but I was never mm -hmm. given the opportunity and um, translation came calling because I had a connection with Chris Sarita who had just taken on the new chief creative officer role. And I had worked with him at Kirschenbaum for uh, like a hot minute on Capital One, but he remembered me mm -hmm. and he reached out Rem and memorable. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to take that as a good thing. Yes. Uh, the, <laughs> so they reached out. Woo. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say it if you were, go the other I way. wouldn't say it if you were an asshole. So uh, I remember you. <laughs> FYI, I'm not going to forget you because you're a dick. Yeah. No. <laughs> thank you. Hopefully. No. Um, so he reached out and it came at this uh, wonderful moment, the way that I think the universe just sends things to you. Um, and he offered me this ACD position which seems, okay, that's a step. And I looked at this like, this is amazing because translation was not well respected in the industry at that time. And it was hardly seen at all. They didn't really have a great website. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a questionable agency. And I thought, you know what? This is my chance to kind of write it from the start, right? To help Chris build it. And I love that challenge. That's cool. When I started there, at the end of my first week, um, there, an email went out that said, like highs and goodbyes and it was hi to emily sander who's starting as an associate creative director and it was goodbye to um this other creative director who had just left now what that meant was there's room to move there was nobody in the middle between chris mm -hmm. and myself oh, that's great and it went so it went chief creative officer down to me i think that there might have been like maybe two other acds that had been there but in that's terms cool. of coming in it was so cool and he came and he said um you know, I want you to manage State Farm, right? which is a major account. And I looked at this as this is the opportunity I've been waiting for my entire career. Right. And I am going, I'm going to, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to, I will do great. It's this. great stuff too. And uh, it's such a classic advertising thing that your title is always one level below what your job is. And it definitely was a translation always. because they ran you're, slim. You're creative director, but your title says associate. Now, yeah. now you prove that you can do this, then we're going to take the associate off your title. Now, see, I was the jerk then too, because I, re I just really wanted to be a creative director. Right. And I don't know why I just really wanted the title. It's fine now. I don't really care. But I wanted to prove to myself in a way that I could do it. Mm -hmm. So on LinkedIn, of course, I like removed sure. the associate. Yeah. And um, and they had to talk to me on the side and yeah, say, you got you got to put that back. <laughs> I saw it. That's crazy. I know. All right. So it, was that okay? The next question was, "What's been the biggest mistake?" Was that the biggest mistake lying on LinkedIn? No. What? what? Yeah, that was, that, was, that was the biggest mistake. Now you know what you you do things and then you learn. It's what is the ask forgiveness than permission? It's exactly. easier to ask forgiveness than permission. Um, the biggest mistake. Oh wow. Um, it might be staying in Chicago just a beat too long. Um. I think that I had done mm. what I was going to do in Chicago at Kramer Cross Alt in the last year. I'm not entirely certain that I learned or that it, it brought ex additional value. I don't mean that as Did any you, insult to no, no, Kramer no. Cross Alt or the city. It's just I feel like I had already been kind of um, ready to get back to New York. Okay. And so I feel like I probably could have jump started that restart okay. back in New York. I was going to ask. I was going to ask it. At any given point in your career, are you aware of what you need to do next? Are you aware of, of like the move you need to make, or do you self evaluate like your sort of short term goal? Like, because always, yeah, that's 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 neurotic and good. It is, and and I got, and you can almost look at my the list of agencies and go, there was something, there was something here. Yeah. Um, 
I am constantly looking at my book and aware, and this is this might also sound really neurotic, but there was a part of me that was aware that I'm only going to get older mm-hmm. and I'm only going to stay a female. Mm. <laughs> and I need to make sure that I am doing projects that continues to show that I am ahead of the game or I'm following the trends even like on top of it so that anytime, cause the worst thing that I, that I heard at moments from recruiters was, and I think a lot of creatives heard this at some point, mm, you don't have enough social digital right. in your book right. or, you know, you don't have enough of this or that or the other. And, and because the, the industry was splintering so much, right. you know, you kind of had to go, well, I present campaigns constantly that have, that have social digital, but at the agency that I'm at, it's hard to sell those right. because that part of the business is farmed out to these other agencies that do uh, social no, digital. I never thought about that, yeah. Yeah, so then I, I said, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to have to make decisions in my career that put me in right position. in the middle. Mm-hmm. And so 360i is an example of me going, you know what? I'm going to put myself right in the middle of social digital. And I'm going to jump out and I, I had primarily, you know, traditional with trying to sell social digital constantly. And I had had some content opportunities and whatnot that I had done. Um, and, it, I, and I'm doing it again with momentum. Is it that I'm different? looking at it and going ex- event experiential. I want to put myself in the center of it. So I'm actually working with the people who do it best. Right. Is it that different? Is the brain, a different brain to think about social and, 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 and experiential? Is it? Or is it, is it all translatable skills from being a traditional creative? Well, I think any any brain that looks at things from a strategic point of view, you know, it's all it's all so related. Isn't it just a learning curve to understand what's possible, and then you can just that's like, it, right? But that's it. It's just the it's it's a learning curve of what's possible and the learning curve of how to execute it. So, right. like, I had never been in a war room before 360i, where like a live like Twitter, I sat, issue, yeah, like, like we had a social department at um, translation. You know, I worked with a lot for State Farm. And they were on call a lot with the clients. We did a lot of content calendars and we did a lot of content. So mm. I was very familiar with it. But that kind of like pure social activation, mm-hmm. I had never just done that. Mm-hmm. And so by doing it, I was challenging myself. And there's a bit of, of fear factor to stepping in and, and stepping in as a creative director and both kind of learning while also getting the younger creatives to understand You've done this for a while. Right. Yeah. And that and there's a little bit and I did that at SCAD because I had never taught before, mm-hmm. but I had to lead a faculty and I had to lead students and kind of convince them that I knew what I was talking about right. in the world of academia. And uh, you know, and, and to some extent I'm doing it at momentum. But I mean, you're right. There's a common thread of look, are you smart? Do you pay attention to insights and strategy? Can you entertain? Can you people? entertain? Yeah, yeah, then great. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. <laughs> All right, final question. Uh, I'm bummed by that. I kind of want to keep the conversation Yeah, okay, we can, we, can, we can answer it slowly. Um, knowing what you know now, um, if you could go back to the day you graduated from University of Texas with your master's in advertising 2014, 20, 2004, yeah. typo, 2004, uh, what would you whisper in young Emily's ear? I would whisper into her ear, I mean, a few things. Um, one don't take it so seriously. Hmm. I looked at whether I was selling an idea as like practically a life or death decision. Hmm. And, I, and, and, and almost like commentary on me as a person and my self-worth. And I think that I would go back and because I think that that tension that I held and that need to want to be perfect kind of um, just added a few gray hairs that I now mm-hmm. have, which I'm very proud of. But awesome. I think that I could have lightened up and just gone with the flow a little more, but you know, to some extent too, you you go through it and you learn it and then you adjust. And because you went through it, I can identify it in other, in other mm. juniors now. And I, and I can, and I'm able to pull them aside and say, Hey, maybe, you know, don't worry about it so much. Or I can pass those lessons on because you, because I went through it. The other thing that I would tell her to do, and this is kind of connected to the lighten up is Go do an improv class mm-hmm. or take a comedy writing class or take a writing class or just do something. Cause I, you know, I went 
I would go to work and then I would go to the bar and I would go home. And mm-hmm. there's a limitation to your life. It becomes small and you can't step out it outside of yourself That's if you great. don't allow yourself those avenues, those outlets That's that are great. better. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you so much for talking. Thank you so much for having me. This was this was wonderful. This oh, was a delight. Excellent. Yeah. Listeners, um, you can follow Emily at, on Instagram at Colonel Sander, and you can find Emily Sander on LinkedIn. That's the professional social network where people lie about their titles. You can fi- <laughs> and then get their hands slapped. Reach me as always <laughs> at Dan's Podcast. Yeah, where I'm like executive creative director. And, <laughs> yeah. Uh, cha- You'll find me on the chief creative officer. I'm of chairman Vinny. of the I'm chairman of the board of Advertising World. <laughs> um, you can reach me at Dan's Podcast at Mac.com. Be sure to like the show on Facebook, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast, and leave a review at iTunes if you're in the mood. Um, and if you liked it, I mean, you know, I don't necessarily need, need more one star reviews. Got plenty of those. Listeners, thank you so much. Emily, thanks again. Thank you. See you, listeners. Bye. Bye. So fun. I love that.